Hello, everybody. My name is Jimmy Smith, and welcome to the Wine with Jimmy channel. This is a WSET level four presentation on Madeira that I have put together. This is part one on history. It's of a multi part series looking at this wonderful fortified wine from the island of Madeira. As ever, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, please do get in touch by commenting on this video, or you can get in touch via my website, which has all of the educational portal on it. That is the winewithjimmy.com website on the contact us page. Otherwise, there is social media that you can find at the bottom of each slide, which is my personal social, social media, plus my businesses, my two wine schools, and my wine bar. So you can get in touch with me via those modes if you wish. You'll find them at the bottom of each screen. Okay, so let's um, start to look at the wonderful product of Madeira. And let's first of all look at where we are in the world. So here is a map of the island of Madeira and also surrounding islands as well. So it's a Portuguese uh, island, which is in the Atlantic Ocean, situated about 600 kilometers off the coast of the African country of Morocco. It sits just north of the Canary Islands and then a, a quite a far distance, but to the southeast of the Azores. It is therefore quite far from the capital city of Portugal, which is Lisbon, which I think is over a thousand kilometers, maybe a little bit less. Um, this area then, it's part of an archipelago, which is uh, uh, includes the islands, as you'll see on the map here, of Porto Santo, but also the Desertas and also the Selvagens as well, which are all kind of, uh, you can see Selvagens is mentioned down in the bottom of this map. Here is Desertas, just in this, the islands Desertas, and then Porto Santo is just here. But here is the very large Madeira Island. It's the largest of the group. It's approximately around 735 square kilometers. So the most sizable by far. Um, the island is, of course, called Madeira, as well as the wine being called Madeira. Madeira takes its name because it means wooded land or wooded island. And this island was severely covered in forests when the first European settlers landed here. So hence they called it Madeira. OK, so that's a little bit on where we are in the world. The next thing we're looking at is, in fact, around the colonization, the first colonization, colonization by European settlers. So this is 1419, the start of the 15th century. We have three quite intrepid explorers. Uh, these were merchants, and you have them here. I've scribbled the names actually at the bottom. João Gonçalves Brazaco, Bartolomeu Perastrello, and then Tristão Vaz Teixeira as well. So not the best picture, I think, of Tristal on the right hand side, um, but we get an idea. Of course, this was quite a long time ago. Uh, so they, um, they came to this island, as I mentioned, it was large areas of forests and wood, hence the name Madeira. Um, but these were burnt to provide land for agriculture and of course then um, viticulture. Uh, all of this burning of this uh, these forests and a lot of the carbon that was uh, um, found within the wood and the potash that made a very fertile landscape over, in essence, what is a volcanic island. So therefore, um, giving some quite fert fertility to the soil of the island. And in fact, histor historical records show that only 25 years after this date, um, product was being exported from the island, including some form or some early form of Madeira wine. So vines must have landed it with the early settlers. That's what we think anyhow. Um, another couple of things about the development of the island as well. So we know that a lot of European settlers started to come through this island as they made their way across new lands. We know this is the 15th century, which was a huge expansion century for many of the European factions. Of course, the Spanish and the Portuguese from the Iberian Peninsula were huge travelers 
and explorers. The Spanish would use the Canary Islands for a base before they either headed down towards the Cape Colony, which is today South Africa, before turning towards the Indies, uh, or going across towards the New World, of course, which the Spanish were very keen on, Haiti, Cuba, and then, of course, places like the Aztec Empire and beyond. Um, the Portuguese, also quite keen as travellers, and they landed here at Madeira, the Azores as well, which is to the northwest of this, um, of this island. So um, development would come here, um, money would come through here, and of course, settlers and skilled labour as well. Uh, in 1495, as it says at the top of this screen, uh, by order of the king, the island was divided up into captaincies, which reflected those three noblemen um, that uh, initially discovered it. And it was then leased to the colonists for development. Um, the first uh, colonists that came here from wealthy families in northern Portugal, that's around the Minho zone, uh, so around the cities of Oporto and places like Villa Nova de Gaia, um, they brought a lot of skilled labour this well. So lots of labourers, craftsmen, slaves were brought across as well. Um, but the skills that the northern Portuguese held in certainly crafting terraces, as we know around the Douro Valley, were implemented here as well. So we have these wonderful terraces, which are supported by stone walls like in this picture, which are called poios. And these poios are, um, are stone walls. Then we have lavadas as well. So you've got this written at the top here. I'll actually include this. Um, in uh, just a bit of highlighting here. So there you go, the stone walls, lavardas. So the lavardas are um, these irrigation channels which were created as well. And these were built to collect and transport water um, throughout the island for both consumption drinking, but also for crop irrigation at the same time. So quite a good intricate network there. So some good development linking it to its homelands, which were in, implemented in this, uh, in this area. Um, next up then is around the first uh, vines being introduced to the area. We are not 100% sure about this, of course. It's a long time ago. We have no records exactly pinpointing the date or the person that brought vines in. Uh, but we thought those early settlers, because we do know that wines were quickly quite well known for Madeira in European markets. And we think, therefore, it's likely to be from the Minho area of Portugal. What grapes would have been planted or what vines were the first planted? Once again, we don't really know specifically, but one thing we have a bit of information about is a Venetian navigator called Alvista Mosto. And Alvista Mosto, um, he stated in around 1450 that of the various vine varieties, Prince Henry the Navigator ordered that land should be planted with Mamzi, brought from Candia, the capital of Crete at the time, and these vines, Malvasia Candia, which we have today across Europe, are growing very well. So that's the first kind of uh, bit of documentation we have of that, uh, of that influence. Then we have um, some export fame. So we know that wine's being produced because in the 15th century, going into the 16th century, we have some information about Madeira and it comes from England. So what we have is we have quite a famous duke called the Duke of Clarence. Uh, the Duke of Clarence was at the end of the 15th century incarcerated in the Tower of London and as a nobleman, he was due to be beheaded. However, the story goes that he was drowned, as the picture in the left dictates, in a butt of Malmsey, a barrel of Malmsey. This was also later echoed in the 16th century by um, the playwright William Shakespeare in the play Richard III. Uh, so it's, it's very typical for, uh, this was during the Wars of the Roses as well, uh, and unfortunately he sided on the wrong side in the end, and uh, he, was, um, he was condemned to death. However, not by beheading, which was the norm, but apparently by drowning. Now, you could read a lot more about that. I'm just giving you a very sort of generic view of it, but perhaps it made the uh, Madeira a little bit more full-bodied. 
Terrible joke, terrible wine joke right there. Today we have a brand on the right hand side, Blandies, which of course bottle under the name Duke of Clarence with that kind of historical link behind it. Um, we also have a little bit more um, here. We have uh, Simao Accioli, who in, uh, in settling on the island and is said to have brought the Malvasia Babosa vine into the country as well. So these Malvasia vines making their way in. Then we have um, wine growth. So the island was not purely known for uh, wine. It, in fact, wasn't really well that well known until later. We have small productions gaining quite a lot of um, European fame and eventually international fame. But the first product, we had sugar here, wheat uh, and uh, other crops, many other crops, bananas even and types of nuts and so on as well. Um, but with competition against other countries, namely Brazil, sugar plantations uh, unfortunately really struggled. And in fact, uh, overproduction then uh, occurred and the price plummeted of sugar. Um, so then they quickly turned to wine production at this point, And this is when we really start to see a growth. Um, coupled with the next part as well, which is the next slide, is the Methuen Treaty. The Methuen Treaty was a treaty signed between the British and the Portuguese at the early part of the 18th century, really uh, as a, um, a bit of a, a move against countries like France and Spain, but really establishing a very good amicable friendship which exists to this day between the Portuguese and the English. It enabled much freer trade between England and Portugal, um, much lower ta tariffs, which meant that, of course, suddenly in England, for instance, wines from Portugal started to flood into the market. Um, so the Methuen Treaty then really started to grow the trade. And this is when a lot of British merchants started to set up shop in Madeira, of course, with companies like Blandy's, for instance. Um, now, also, we have shipping around this time, lots of shipping of the Madeira. Um, and here is a picture of some barrels which looks like in a hull of a ship. Uh, so it was soon found out that somehow Madeira wines would taste far better after some time spent in the heat of the hull of a ship. And of course, this is in the long sea journeys with the sun glaring down on the ship and pitching and rolling as it would across the tropics. Um, with this discovery came the fashion for the Vigno de Roda, as it says at the top. So these round trip wines were preferred to the wines which were, mat which were matured in cask at the island. Uh, so what would end up happen, in fact, because people were uh, demanding this style which had been heated up and cooked a little bit on uh, on a ship or in a ship, uh, wine production shifted from maturing on the island to maturing on ship. So the ships would load up with these barrels of unmatured mature Madeira, then they would go to their destination markets, but they would not unload at those destination markets. In fact, this, this would really be like extra ballast, which will be in the ship. And then it will come back to the island of Madeira after many, many months or even years maturing. And of course, will have gained this more kind of character, which was very well loved at the time. Uh, so very highly sought after and sold at a very, very high price, of course. Um, then, in the 18th century, we have um, the um, implementation of fortification and the estufagam system, which is something we'll talk in a lot more detail later on down the line. Um, originally, though, it's important to know this because like port, Madeira wines really seem to have started off as unfortified um, with the realization of fortification stabilizing wines only coming later. Uh, so they realized, of course, putting these wines on ships, they may not uh, get to their final destination in the best quality. So spirit, probably distilled from cane sugar, was adopted as a stabling additive. Uh, and then it was uh, it was added uh, normally just before being put onto ship as well. So not uh, at that time during the production process. So this is very early stage of fortification. 
And also in the course of the 18th century as well, we have the so-called estufagem system or process, which was developed to really reproduce the um, effect of, of, of kind of cooking the wine in the ships, you know, that would be sent across the world. So they created um, these uh, buildings, these loft areas, which would of course heat up and replicate that process. And of course, many different pipes uh, ended up after that. We'll go through this in much greater detail later on down the line. Uh, this was much cheaper and then was kind of widely rolled out across the island of Madeira. Um, then we have a lot of challenges and this is not the most sexiest of pictures here. It's a bit of a horrible one to look at. Uh, but of course the 19th century after quite a lot of success there were issues that started to come from the Americas. And we have the big challenges such as phylloxera, which hit in the mid to late 19th century in Madeira, but also things like the mildews as well, which destroyed vines and reduced yields. We also then have problems from the Americas again. Prohibition in the United States from 1920 to 1933, mostly, uh, as this picture shows, was a huge issue for lots of consumption of alcohol, of course, being prohibited for this. Um, America had become a very, very significant market at this time for Madeira. And of course, this shook the foundations of Madeira's export markets. The two world wars also, uh, either side of prohibition, um, mainly in Europe, really uh, hit Madeira's European markets uh, and also things like the Russian Revolution as well. So really uh, lots of turbulent times as there were for many products in the wine industry. Uh, but towards the end of the century, stay, uh, sales became more stable, uh, but as ever, consumer uh, uh, tastes started to change. Uh, so the, they never really reclaimed their, their export sales from those times. And then we finally have just a couple of things here. We have the Instituto de Vino de Madeira, which was founded in 1979 to regulate Madeira. Uh, in 1986, uh, Portugal became a part of the EU as it was formalized uh, and further regulations were introduced as well through the EU. Uh, together with the subsidies, which were given through the EU, uh, quality of Madeira increased, uh, and this has continued with, into the 21st century. And the Instituto de Vino de Madeira has changed name again today. It's, uh, um, I can't remember exactly what it is now today, but it's something quite similar sounding. Uh, so that is the uh, Instituto de Vino de Madeira. And the final part of this is, uh, of course, um, just a few years after that, in 1985, very important moment in time, we have the, uh, of course, the the birth of the famous export another famous export of madeira cristiano ronaldo and this is the best picture i could find with him with wine but with grapes uh, i'm not sure if it's been photoshopped or not i don't care but cristiano ronaldo of course born on the madeira and a famous export nonetheless uh, that brings us up to modern days just a nice sort of light-hearted way to finish i hope you have enjoyed this video it is a shorter one just to introduce this category We've got many more videos to go part two will look at the wine laws and business side of madeira so i hope to see you there thank you so much for your time if you have any comments questions or concerns once again you can please pop them in the comments section get in touch via the wine with jimmy website or by social media that you'll find at the bottom of each slide and if you are in london and you fancy uh, maybe a bit of education or a glass of wine come and see us please come and see us for a class a glass or a bottle or a magnum my name's been jimmy smith cheers for now goodbye